All right, here we are. Go ahead and tell some stories about your early life. Okay, my name is Louise, and uh, I grew up in Marion, Utah, which is a small farming community. When I was a child, there was no store there. There was um, a building that we went to church in, and there was a building that had been the church when I was teeny, teeny, teeny that someone had bought and uh, changed it over to a, we called it the feed plant. So farmers could buy grain there, but you, you couldn't, sh you know, households couldn't shop there. And uh, there were probably 200 people in the town of Marion. And so we went to a neighboring town for grocery shopping, which my parents seldom, seldom, seldom did. Um, I had a wonderful childhood. I enjoyed it very much. I lived on a sheep ranch. We had a few milk cows. We had, I'm not sure, maybe two to 400 sheep. I really don't know now. Um, we raised hay and grain, and we raised um, peas for the cannery, uh, Woods Cross Cannery, and they bought peas from us and canned them and sold them on the grocery store. Anyway, um, when I was... Uh, young, why my father did his um, farming with horses. We eventually got a jeep like the old army jeeps. I learned to drive the jeep when I was eight. Drove it in the fields to pull the sprinkler pipe wagon. Um, I had a horse that I rode. His name was Bud. Uh, all the other family members had ridden Bud. Um, by the time I came along, I was almost the only one that rode Bud. He was a brown pony. He was bigger than a pony, but he wasn't, wasn't a big horse. Um, in those days, we, we seldom talked about what, uh, breed a horse was. If they were big, we called them work horses. If they were little, we called them riding horses. So Bud was a small riding horse. He, uh, he was full of pep and energy. He liked to jog trot, which was not a real comfortable gait for the rider, um, especially if you're riding bareback. If you rode in a saddle and had your foot in the stirrups, you could kind of lift yourself up a little bit. But uh, he was a good horse, and I, in the summer I got to ride him almost every day. You ride uh, bareback mostly? Mostly bareback. In those days, they had the theory that uh, bareback was safer, especially for kids, uh, because if you got your foot tangled in the stirrup and fell off, you could get dragged to death. And that did happen to my Aunt Elizabeth's husband. My Aunt Elizabeth was my father's oldest sister, and she married a man and... They moved to Idaho, and he did uh, get his foot caught in the stirrup and fell fell off or got uh, got bucked off or something, and, and the horse did drag him and kill him. And so she she was a widow before she had children. So uh, I almost always rode bareback. Um, when I was, one of the first times that I rode Bud, he ran away with me. And run away means you can't control the horse. If the horse starts running and gets out of control, so the way you control the horse is pull hard on the reins. That There's a, a, a bit in the mouth of the horse that pulls it and holds it in, but uh, I wasn't strong enough to hold Bud in, and he ran ran south out towards the old stable, and I fell off. I was probably five, maybe six. I didn't, I could, I, I didn't know how to get back on out there. I, in order to get on the horse, I'd, I'd 
he had been trained to come up beside um, pole fence or a stump or whatever so that I could get on. I was not athletic, and I wasn't able to get on. So I walked home and led him home. The, the good thing about Bud is after he'd run away and, and you'd fall off, he'd at least stop and wait and let you catch him and bring him back. But uh, the rule was if you ever fell off the horse or ever got run away with, you had to get right back on so that you wouldn't be afraid and so that you'd let the horse know that you were the boss. So I had to get right back on. But that's the only way, only time he ever ran away with me. But as far as I know, any person that ever rode Bud, he ran away with them the first time they rode him. <laughs> but uh, he was he was sure a pleasure. I loved riding him. I rode, uh, rode him uh, from when I was little until I went away to college. And, and when I went to BYU in 1957, that's the year I graduated from high school, and uh, <clears throat> within the first or second year that I was away from college, away to college, uh, Bud got uh, old and sick, and they had to put him away. So, and that was just before the folks moved from Marion, Utah, to Lava Hot Springs, Idaho. Um, I I had an ideal childhood. I, I was the member of a large family, so I had the advantages of a large family, and uh, I was I was the little little sister, and everyone treated me well. I, I some some kids in a large family have uh, sibling rivalry and competition. I didn't have any of that. Ken was four years older, and Doug was six years younger, so. I basically had the advantage of an only child in a large family, and well, I did. In, if you I were like an only my childhood, pardon me. If you're like an only child, you'd be more spoiled and selfish right now, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, I don't know how my parents did it, but uh, in my opinion, uh, they didn't spoil us. We. We somehow knew what was appropriate behavior, and we, we did it. We didn't whine and boob, and we didn't uh, coax. So. Okay. Um, I had a tricycle that I would ride back and forth on the, on my, the front sidewalk for the to the front gate, to the steps, and back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. Uh, when I got older, I learned to ride a bicycle, but I didn't have a very good place to ride a bicycle. We lived at the top of the lane. It was a, a, a mile down to the main road, which was tar, but our lane at that point was gravel. It's, it's a tar road now, but it was gravel then. So... It was fine to jump on the bike and ride down the road, but it wasn't fun getting back up the road. So my favorite transportation was the horse instead of the bike. <laughs> uh, let me let me interrupt you real quick. You said that your dad farmed. What did he farm? What did we raise on the farm? Yeah. Um, it was a sheep ranch, and we had... I, I think we probably had 400 head of sheep, but I might be wrong. Maybe it was more like 200. And uh, the money from that was selling wool and selling lambs. And uh, the lambs were born in the spring, and then you'd sell them in the fall. And uh, shearing the sheep would happen in the spring so that you get the wool off before they got too hot. I love to watch the sheep shearing. Normally, they hired someone to come and shear the sheep. Nowadays, well, not nowadays, because Ken and Jim don't have sheep now, but a few years ago when they had sheep, I think that uh, 
Ken probably mostly sheared them, but when I was a kid, my dad didn't shear the sheep, and they hired shearers. So in shearing season, my <clears throat> the shearers would come, and they'd shear the sheep in a pen, and somebody would <clears throat> take uh, wool strings, pull the loose wool that had been sheared off, uh, gather it into a bundle and take strings and tie around it and then they throw it up on a platform kind of like an attic in the top of the sheep shed and I could uh, stay up there and look down and watch them shear but then when the fleece would come up we'd put it into a wool bag and a wool bag was um, oh probably eight feet long I, want, I don't know if it was that long or not but it, it was uh, maybe six feet anyway it was huge you had to put the wool bag around in a hoop to hold it up and then tuck it under so that you could secure it and then they'd throw the fleece in and then someone would tromp it they'd, they'd get in the wool bag and tromp it so that they could stack more wool in and I love to watch that. I, I, I don't think I was ever much help with that, but I did help drive the sheep in off of the sheep range to have them close for uh, shearing time. And then my mom had to feed the sheep shearers, so she had to cook them a hearty meal and... <laughs> Potatoes. And, uh, and uh, sometimes we had Mexicans, but I, I remember I was so surprised that my mom made uh, coffee for the sheep shearers, and she also cooked bacon for the sheep shearers. I never saw coffee or bacon in our home any other time except for the sheep shearers. <laughs> then, of course, for, for the noon meal we called it dinner why we had potatoes and gravy which was what everybody ate then but I think we had meat too well as I grew up we seldom had meat to eat my dad did not like meat and he did not believe it was good for you he thought the word of wisdom said you shouldn't eat it unless you were really, really, really hungry, but it, it didn't set well with him. If he ate meat, it, it didn't make him feel good in his stomach. So, uh... So, why did you, why did you move sprinkler pipe just to water pasture for the sheep to feed on? When I was fairly young, my family bought sprinkler pipe, and that was we were the first person, uh, the first people in northern Utah to own a sprinkler system. They, uh, someone had started to do that in southern Utah, but uh, wow, when we got our sprinkler system, it, it brought people from far and wide. And uh, when I was about eight, I learned to drive the Jeep to pull the sprinkler pipe wagon. So that's about the time that we got the sprinkler pipe and the only pipe that we'd ever seen was steel pipe and it was heavy so uh, the county agent came to see us and see our sprinkler pipe and uh, someone I, I don't know if it was the guy that sold it to us or whoever anyway I was a kid and they asked me to pick up a sprinkler pipe and, and they were astonished that a kid could lift a pipe that big. And it was light because it was aluminum. Or was but, it because uh, you were so strong? No, it was because it was light. <laughs> but some guy, a, a local farmer came by and somebody told him to lift the pipe and he expected it to be really, really heavy and he reached down and picked it up and, <laughs> he almost fell over backwards. It was so light. Anyway. So why did you have uh, a sprinkler pipe? What? What was the purpose of having sprinklers? 
for just well, for sheep, you, you or did you raise you crops? To, you had to raise the crop. You had to have water on the crop, hay and grain and peas. And if you didn't have sprinkler pipe, then your water ran through a ditch, and then you'd open the ditch different places and flood irrigate and try to herd the water around so that it got over all of the ground. And that took some doing. They had to plow ditches and go irrigate with a shovel and try to get it. So with the sprinkler pipe, that was a lot better in that you could uh, make sure that you covered the whole field with water. So you didn't just <laughs> raise sheep, you raised <laughs> crops too. Well, we raised crops to feed the sheep, yeah. The sheep eat peas? What? Did the sheep eat peas? No, we sold the peas as a cash crop to get money because the sheep didn't make enough money. So, so we would uh, plant and water and harvest the crops in the summer. And then in the winter, we would uh, feed the hay to the sheep. Uh, uh, some grain, I don't think we fed the sheep much grain, but some, but, um, uh, but we would, when we harvested the peas, we would haul them to North Marion, kind of on the boundary of Marion and Oakley. <laughs> it was called the pea vinery. And, uh, You'd throw the peas off of the wagon into a, I think you'd call the term a hopper, but uh, there were teeth that were going along like this and uh, up on a conveyor belt, and that would take the peas and the vines and everything in, and then there was a big roller with a big canvas on it that would roll it around, and that would shell the peas, and the peas would roll down, and the vines and the pods would go up another conveyor belt and on to a stack, a pea vine stack. And then uh, that would make silage. So those peas, as a, because you put them in green, and then they would um, ferment. And there, was a, there would be a period of time after pea harvest where those things, they did stink. It was, they turned into alcohol, <laughs> and they did stink. But then in the winter, my dad would go with his team and sleigh and uh, get pea vines and bring them back and feed them to the sheep. And we uh, harvested hay and put them in big hay stacks, too. And then every day, he would have to uh, feed the sheep uh, hay. Cool. All right, I got one more question, and then we can end this session. It's not really a question, it's a comment. You said that you weren't very athletic as a kid, but as long as I've known you, you've been really athletic. Oh, I have not. <laughs> yeah, you have. I had a, a friend that was my age, and sometimes she lived in the house just west of us. Uh, the, the house that was just west of us was usually lived in by John and Margie and their family as I grew up. I, I don't know how come, but anyway, uh, this was Renee Russell, and she and her parents lived there, and she was my age, and she was a horseman, horsewoman. And uh, <clears throat> her dad uh, was a horse trader, and he, he always had some new horse and it didn't matter what horse it was she could ride it but I watched her and this this astonished me I was probably in the fifth grade when this happened they had a, a, a big Palomino workhorse that they called King and Renee reached up twined King's mane around her fingers he reached up about as far as she could reach. That's how tall that horse was. And she wrapped her fingers in his mane and then gave a leap and a swing and swang, swung her leg up over his withers and scrambled up and got on his back. 
I would have had to have a step ladder to get on him. Well, I bet she never taught her kids how to do a proper left-handed layup. Never taught them what? How to do a proper left-handed layup. <laughs> I bet she never either. In fact, I'm not sure she ever had any children. Um, <laughs> when, when I got back from my mission, I went to uh, Camas Valley Livestock Show. And uh, that was an annual celebration they had. It was kind of like a mini, mini, mini county fair, but uh, they would have uh, livestock judging and they'd have a rodeo. And she was a trick rider at the rodeo. And she was good. I was astonished at the stuff she could do, trick riding. That was so far beyond me. Of course, I'd have been, I'd, I, I'd rather have been on a mission than learning to trick ride. But I don't think she lived very long after that. And I don't I don't know if she ever had children or not. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to end this recording. <laughs>